and we are recording. Okay. All right, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the latest virtual monthly iteration of the EFF Austin Meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I am the current president of the board at EFF Austin. You're, we're also very lucky that we have a quite a few board members here in the room with us tonight. I see Maggie Duvall, I see Heather Barfield, uh, David Hensley, a number of our board members are here. Um, but yes, uh, welcome to a bunch of old faces, but also quite a few new faces. Um, for those of you who are first timers and are like, hey, this seems pretty cool. I saw it on the internet. Electronic Frontier Foundation mentioned it or National Cyber Watch Center mentioned it. And I'm wondering what this is. Um, EFF Austin, um, is a longstanding Austin-based digital civil liberties organization. We are closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco, which is the nation's oldest and most preeminent digital civil liberties advocacy group. You can sort of think of them as the ACLU for the internet if you've never heard of them, but they fight to preserve your rights, especially your first and fourth amendment rights in emerging technological spaces. They fight for things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption, banning warrantless backdoors, protection, protecting section 230 of the CDA, and all sorts of good, wonderful uh, freedom preserving initiatives uh, and making it so that new technology serves us and not the other way around. Um, so, um, as I said, we are Austin based and we've been, we're actually celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Um, um, we will probably do something to celebrate it, so stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah. Um, so the main things we do as an org are mostly educational. Um, compared to national EFF, which mostly does federal uh, lobbying, we mostly uh, are an educational organization based out of Austin. Um, we try to educate on emerging technologies and examine them from a legal or societal implication standpoint. We also, uh, when not in COVID times, have been known to throw some pretty fun cyberpunk themed parties. <laughs> we also do a bit of, um, of work with the Texas legislature, um, trying to both lobby for bills and give feedback on various bills. In fact, that is something going on right now. And we have a number of write-ups on relevant bills that are currently before the House and Senate that our board member, David Hensley, put together. I will, at some point here, drop the link in the chat to those if you're interested in learning more and getting educated. But we're an all-volunteer org. Um, we encourage you to reach out and get involved, whether you're based in Austin or not, if you want to be part of our community and you care about these issues. You're also always welcome to donate to us at the PayPal on our website. Although if you're short of cash, you should give EFF your money before you give EFF Austin money, but we always appreciate the donations. Um, so this is the place where I do a few brief community announcements after introducing who we are, and then I introduce our speaker and they will uh, take it away. But just gonna give you a quick preview into some of the things that we are exploring uh, for the coming months. The main thing we're doing these days uh, virtually is these ongoing monthly meetups, which are the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. We have a number of interesting speakers coming up over the next several months. We'll be hearing at some point, um, when, I don't want to get her last name wrong, let me get it. Um, we will be hearing at some point from uh, an old EFF Austin advisor, uh, Tracy LaQuay Parker, who is going to be talking to us about some of the history of how the current laws around internet spam came to be because she and EFF Austin were very intimately involved in that in back in the 90s. Um, we're also going to be hearing uh, from some people from the city of Austin's innovation office about some software they're developing to try to help the uh, houseless um, manage their documents and hopefully prevent them from getting lost or stolen, which is a major problem for the houseless. We've been consulting with them on making sure the solution is going to be privacy and, and uh, preserving both of data and location and things like that. So we're probably going to have the innovation office come and talk about their work on that. We'll also probably be hearing from uh, what our uh, friends, uh, Michael Running Wolf and Caroline Old Coyote, who are a couple of uh, Native American indigenous activists um, who do a lot of cool electronic frontier adjacent sort of work, particularly around uh, native language preservation. We're probably going to be hearing from them sometime in the next few months. So we have a number of uh, interesting talks coming up that we hope you'll come to. Um, as I said, we're also actively working on, uh, on um, informing the public about bills before the Texas House and Senate right now. 
Um, if that's an effort that interests you or you'd like to learn more or get more involved, I encourage you to reach out. I will also be dropping my email in the chat. Um, oh, and also a final uh, thing I want to make note of that we are going to be trying uh, something fun and a little experimental uh, the first time at this virtual meetup. Um, as everybody knows, uh, Zoom, while a miraculous technology, is not the most conducive to fun or socialization or partying. And we de sorely miss our happy hours at Firehouse Hostel and Lounge that we would do downtown after our meetups. We are planning to experiment with a post-meeting virtual gathering using the platform Gather.Town, which is basically like playing an old Nintendo game it, it's video conference chatting, but it adds space and environment so you can wander a virtual party while still video chatting with people. We think it's a lot more fun and easy to socialize in there. There's also virtual poker and other games. So we think it'll be a far better way for us to maybe all try to socialize than uh, just hanging around here awkwardly staring at all each other's faces on this wall. So you don't have to come to that if you don't want to, but I'll be dropping the link and information to that in the chat as well. We encourage you to join us after the talk if that sounds like fun. <laughs> okay, I've rambled on long enough. Before I introduce our speaker, I'm gonna briefly ask if there's any announcements that the community would like to share. Um, anything that you think would be of interest to the Digital Civil Liberties community. Uh, shameless self-promotion is totally fine as long as you think it would be of interest to this community, but is there anything going on in Austin or otherwise that you would like the community at large to know about? Um, feel free to virtually raise your hand and I will call on you if that is the case. Nobody? Okay, that's cool. I just always like to check. Okay, without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker for this month. Oh, and before I introduce our speaker, I want to say that this event is being uh, presented in partnership uh, with the National Cyber Watch Center um, through our speaker this month, Owen. He connected me with them. I was not aware they were a thing until he raised um, my knowledge of their existence. But they are a cool organization that is working to try to uh, better educate this uh, country on cybersecurity issues and raise the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. They also do a lot of work with uh, community college networks, trying to uh, train uh, the vast number of knowledgeable professionals who understand cybersecurity that we're really gonna need to meet the challenges of the 21st century, something that I think you may become acutely aware of after uh, you listen to Owen's talk here. But uh, yes, so our speaker this month is Owen McNally. Owen is a longtime EFF Austin supporter and friend. He has spoken uh, at a few of our events in the past, including our very fun uh, 20, uh, 2017 or 2018, I can't remember which, but at our big cyberpunk South by Southwest party at the Butterfly Bar and Vortex Theater, where he was one of our opening speakers for Bruce Sterling and Corey Doctorow. So we're very excited to welcome Owen back to talk to us. Um, Owen is a researcher and technology analyst in Austin, Texas. He's the chair of the EFF Austin Cybersecurity Work Group, and he's also the founder of the Data Science versus COVID Project. An enduring theme in his work over recent decades is the analysis and evaluation of technology for usability, quality, and ethics based on humanistic principles. He's joined a series of software development teams as a usability and quality assurance analyst and subsequently has earned an interdisciplinary PhD at UT Austin with a program of work in medical cognitive science. He has taught college level software design, cognitive studies, psychology, research methods, and statistics for the behavioral sciences. His recent year, in recent years, his work has been in software usability, cybersecurity training, medical research, and analysis for investors in energy storage, AI, hospital technology, neurotechnology, and logistics. So, um, to now give a little bit of a preamble to the motivation of this talk, why we thought it'd be good for Owen to come speak. As we all know, very prominent um, hacking incidents have been in the news recently, most famously and prominently the Solar Winds hack, which was the largest, most devastating hacking incident the uh, United States has ever seen, or at least that we publicly know we have ever seen. It uh, had, it's hard to overstate how big the impact of this hacking incident was. Um, the vendor in question, SolarWinds, that was hacked um, is a provider for like 400 of the Fortune 500 companies as far as providing network management and security. All five branches of the Pentagon, numerous government departments. Um, the potential scope of them being compromised is hard to overstate. 
And um, actually, very interestingly enough, uh, why we at EFF Austin thought it was a topic worthy of exploring was uh, not only is SolarWinds an Austin-based company that is not very far from where I live, their headquarters actually, but um, actually Austin had, bears a distinction of they are the only city that we know of in the United States where their city network was hacked and compromised as part of the SolarWinds incident. So. This incident had especially close to a uh, home here for us in Austin. So we figured it'd be good to just talk with an expert about some of the state of current uh, cybersecurity and how worried we should or shouldn't be. So Owen being especially an expert as this relates to, to medical data and medical cybersecurity, we figured it'd be fun for him to give a talk about his expertise. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, I am going to turn things over to Owen. And um, I think we're all going to be very interested in what he has to teach us. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to, for me to be uh, Captain Buzzkill in case anyone was enjoying the year 2021 and maybe thinking, hey, we're maybe beating COVID and maybe the economy's coming back and, you know, uh, we have a normal human being, uh, you know, as the, uh, the head of state. Um, well, I'm going to just not that you feel too good about things. Uh, because the situation with uh, cybersecurity is deteriorating and the situation with healthcare cybersecurity and uh, medical cybersecurity in particular seems to be getting worse. I'm not going to call it a crisis. Kevin, I kind of sparred a little bit over this the other day. Um, you know, if you if you say that it is and you're wrong, then, you know, you're the uh, you're you're a person who's promoting alarmism. OK. Um, if, uh, the boy who cried wolf. Okay. If it's not a crisis and you don't say that it's a crisis, that's fine. If it is a crisis and you say that it's a crisis, that's fine too. But if it's, um, a crisis and you don't say anything, then you are potentially, uh, not getting people sufficiently alarmed about the situation. So I'm not really sure where in that grid, where we are, to be honest, I'm not, going to right now say we're in a crisis situation, unless you are a personally a victim of a breach. If you got one of those letters, um, the uh, organization that sends you that letter, which they're legally required to inform you under the uh, federal HIPAA statute of uh, 1996, if you get one of these letters, they will tell you that they found out at some point that your data was part of a breach. And you may feel like it's a crisis at that point because of how valuable your information is to bad actors on what we call the dark web. It is among the most valuable types of information. It's far more valuable than your credit card information is, interestingly, which I found that somewhat counterintuitive. So I am going to do a screen share here. And... Um, Let's see. I can see your desktop. It is working, Owen. Okay, that is good to know. My desktop's still working. All right. Okay. So it's 2021, and we are dealing with the uh, very um, unpleasant possibility that some of our personal information uh, that was uh, generated at hospitals or clinics has been breached. We call this PHI, so protected health information. And I would just say that I've been tracking this for several years now. It seems to be getting worse by the year, and then it got even worse because of COVID. Now, let me just back up for a moment here that this, this talk, as Kevin mentioned, is being uh, you know, co-sponsored, uh, if you will, by not just EFF Austin, but my former employers over at the uh, National Cyber Watch Center. Uh, National Cyber Watch is a consortium of higher education institutions, businesses, and government agencies focused on collaborative efforts to advance information security, education, and to strengthen the national cybersecurity workforce. So my worldview is heavily influenced by working with them and specifically being tasked to analyze the cybersecurity trainer shortage. 
I have a white paper coming out on this later this year. I'm going to present at a conference. So there's a lot of interest in why we can't get enough trainers to train the talent that we need. There's there's a gap of millions of cybersecurity professionals, and there's also a gap of the people who are supposed to train them. And uh, it's it's just going to keep getting worse until we do something about it. So first, the bad news. Oh, and it's only bad news. There's, there's no good news here. So I think the situation's gotten worse since we've been in COVID. So even before COVID hit, most of the hospitals, especially the, the rural ones and the, uh, the under-resourced ones, they're already playing defense. When COVID hit, this was a remarkable event in the history of American medicine. A, uh, a physician that I've been collaborating with on the uh, on the data science versus COVID project was just telling me, I mean, they had never seen anything like this. This is a one, maybe once in a century event, and it was all hands on deck for hospitals and hospital staff. And that includes the IT team and uh, whoever it is that's tasked with cybersecurity. The, the, uh, the bad actors took advantage of this situation to step up their attacks which just shows you the, the, uh, the, the level of like moral depth that uh, the um, bad actors are engaged in. They, they you know, you, you may remember this phrase, there is no honor among thieves. To hit healthcare and hospital institutions in the midst of a maybe one in a hundred year crisis is just a grotesque, but that's what's going on. So, what I'm going to do here is to really open up some of the core metrics I think that are going to give us a sense of the developing situation. So um, I'm a fan of this uh, this free newsletter. There's actually a series of them um, that's like Becker's Hospital Review and Becker's Healthcare and you know Becker's uh, Hospital Finance. And if you're in the healthcare world and healthcare IT. This uh, is a pretty nice free newsletter that you can get on, depending on, on the branch of, of healthcare you're most interested in. So uh, I see this uh, piece about a week ago. Anna Mitchell summarizes some of the, the studies that are being done on cybersecurity. So this is very, very fresh reporting. BitGlass study finds healthcare data breaches were up 55.1% in 2020 from 2019. The cost per record breached was four hundred twenty nine dollars in twenty twenty. Four hundred twenty nine per record. That's pretty upsetting. That's extraordinarily valuable on the dark web. So healthcare firms took on average two hundred thirty six days to recover from a breach. That's all time that they're not doing other things. It's all time that they are reacting and not able to be proactive. That's all time that they can't. To work on making the electronic health re records more user friendly and more uh, doctor friendly. So, more uh, metrics here. Uh, CrowdStrike report found that 104 healthcare organizations oh, were targeted by 18 ransomware organizations. And we should go into ransomware a little bit here. It's utterly irresponsible, but hospitals pay the ransoms. It, it just incentivizes this to happen worse in the future. It, it gives the uh, criminal organizations funds for R&D, funds for recruiting, funds for uh, doing what they do uh, at an even more dangerous level. But the hospitals feel like uh, if they don't pay the ransom, then they will lose their data and I think this has actually happened. I think these these bad actors will go ahead and destroy years or maybe even decades worth of critical clinical patient information if they don't get the money. So ransomware is the top cyber attack threat to hospitals uh, with the group uh, Sadanokibi profiting perhaps at $123 million in 2020. I'm guessing they're Russian and uh, that's quite a lot of money in Russia. It's quite a lot of money anywhere, but but that that's really big bucks over there. And a Frost Radar report found that more than 90% of healthcare organizations reported at least one breach in the last three years. 
most hospitals spend around 64% more on advertising uh, in a year following a data breach because the letters go out, word gets out, it's embarrassing, bad PR. 64% more on advertising, that's, that's a striking metric. 20% of Americans had a healthcare provider affected by a cyber attack in the last 12 months, according to Morphosec. 27% of consumers said if their data was exposed from a cyber attack on their healthcare provider, they would consider switching to a new provider, according to Morphosec. If you can't trust Morphosec, who can you trust? Morphosec, uh, isn't that a character from the Matrix? So these are these are quite disturbing. I mean, they they the last time I gave this talk was or a version of this is a I don't know a year and a half ago to National Cyber Watch Center, and the numbers were looking bad year over year, and then they got really bad um, in 2020. Um, and you know, I uh, think that it's up to someone else to label this a crisis. But if it happens, if you or your family have your personal health information breached and sold on the uh, the dark web, what impact that has on you, on your, you know, uh, who knows, really, it, it may throw you into a, a state of paranoia and uh, your identity is then compromised. The reason why this data is so valuable is because there's so many separate pieces of information that can be used to establish identity. So uh, here's some more metrics. Healthcare data records may be valued at up to $250 per record on the black market compared to that uh, other estimate of something like uh, $400 uh, per record. So, you know, I, I don't know where they get this information. I'm a researcher myself. I don't ask you to believe this on faith. You know, uh, these are widely cited sources. That doesn't mean that they're correct. Um, often in the game of research, you know, you're, you're dealing with uh, proxy data that represents something you can't quite get direct access to. Um, so, you know, take this as provocative and interesting and disturbing, but not necessarily the, you know, definitive authoritative source on this. On the other hand, I've been, you know, in this space for several years and I, I, uh, I don't uh, promulgate or disseminate any sources that I think are obviously uh, uh, false. So compared to banking and credit data, I mean, that's well over an order of magnitude um, more uh, per record. There may be a question of apples and oranges here, like what, what a piece of data is in healthcare versus what a piece of data is, you know, in a, in a banking or credit data. I, I, I'm not necessarily going to uh, say that this is, uh, is the only way to measure this stuff, but, but, but it is interesting. So a guy named uh, David McLeod, um, who's uh, at darkreading.com. Again, you can't trust darkreading.com, who can you trust? Uh, he's a, a, a very interesting writer and a guy who has a company in this. So he's calling it like he sees it. Um, he says here, according to a study, uh, referencing the one I just mentioned by Trustwave, Banking and credit data is worth 540 per record on the dark web, while healthcare records are worth over 250 each. This is because healthcare records typically contain virtually all the private and protected information that exists for that person, including banking and credit card data. And uh, he's mentioning a, a report um, that Verizon did. He's comparing data from Verizon's 2016 and 2019 data breach reports, there has been a threefold increase in both the number of data incidents and the number of actual data breaches arising from these incidents. Further, those numbers are still growing in 2020, which uh, the 2020 report shows a shocking 71% increase in breaches of healthcare information, shows 43% of phishing attacks and malware that steals passwords originated from the cloud. It's a twofold increase since 2019. So the year over year numbers are, are not edifying. Now, people who are writing about this stuff um, are often people who have skin in the game. This guy, if I remember, David McLeod's got a company um, so, you know, he's going to be getting particular numbers out there that get your attention. So, you know, I, I, I just want you to kind of keep your, your sort of uh, critical mindset about trying to be a, a you know, discerning consumer of information and, and not just letting the fact that I'm maybe an authority or I'm certainly a researcher who's interested in this stuff uh, be the, uh, the thing that 
convinces you something is true. I mean, these, these numbers are, uh, are what they are. They're interesting and they're provocative and they're disturbing and they may even be true. So um, McLeod goes on to say the 2020 Verizon report also found that 70% of all computer hacks were completed by external actors. 55% completed by organized crime groups. Is your organization as prepared to protect data as hackers are in their intent to compromise it? So he mentions, you know, that 86% of the breaches were financially motivated, 90% of breaches being carried out by brute force attacks against breakable passwords or with stolen credentials, most likely harvested by business email compromise activities like phishing attacks. So there's a particular, particularly dangerous threat called spear phishing, where you you're in a healthcare organization and you get a email address to you that will say like, hey, Kevin, um, you know, did you see that report I sent you? Could you go ahead and, and click and, you know, on this so um, uh, you can send me this, you know, and um, or, or, or look at this uh, summary before you send the next version of the report. And, you know, you're a person who's dealing with 16 different reports and you're like, okay, uh, who am I getting this from? Bill in HR or something. Okay. It's actually, you're getting it from Chaos Dragon 57 who, you know, lives in Moscow. So spear phishing attacks will be crafted to uh, to get a, a particular person thinking that it's a colleague. And, and these are where ransomware will get into hospitals. So um, the numbers don't look good. I'm not seeing anybody saying the numbers are improving. I would uh, ask you if you are a person who's deep into this space and you think these numbers are wrong or you think there's better numbers to maybe indicate the, the situation, please come talk to me, come talk to EFF Austin, come tonight, just you know, get in the chat room. I mean, you know, um, we want to know what the truth is, good, bad, ugly, what have you. So I, I, by all means, welcome people who will want to push back at any particular piece of this or any particular, uh, you know, uh, study or data point. So why are we in this situation? Well, we've underinvested. It's the simple, the simple uh, explanation. There's a talent shortage in cybersecurity. There's not nearly enough people who are adequately trained. Cybersecurity itself changes rather, rather quickly. The uh, core competencies 10 years ago are still in use today, but the situation's changed. What, what you would need to know as a cybersecurity professional is different. So a lot of cybersecurity people are IT professionals who have retrained and they maybe start doing, um, keeping the servers running. And over time, they learn as much as possible about the threat vectors. They learn about penetration testing. They learn about malware. They learn about uh, spear phishing and all the rest of it. And then maybe if there's a data breach, they become uh, highly knowledgeable about forensics and assessing the impact of a data breach upon an organization and trying to calculate the value of exfiltrated data. So a person who did not have these skills when they started out, we'll get these skills, but we're playing catch up. We're not upskilling the cybersecurity workforce quickly enough to have the credentialed professionals who are embracing learning curves such that they can keep up with this very dynamic situation. Part of why that is, is because we don't have enough trainers. And that's what my white paper that is forthcoming will be about. We don't have enough trainers because you can make more money doing cybersecurity than training people to do cybersecurity. That's, that's the simple summary of the uh, white paper I have. We've got to figure out some other ways to pay for this stuff, pay for the talent to train the talent, pay for the teachers to teach the teachers and the, the trainers to train the trainers if necessary. We've got to figure this stuff out, um, but we're not figuring it out. I mean, it's we're reacting while the, the bad guys are innovating. We're playing defense while they're figuring out all kinds of new tricks to be on offense. So what is unfortunately the case is that the hospitals and uh, healthcare entities 
that can least afford breaches are the ones that are most vulnerable. And patients who have the fewest resources to cope with a data breach are disproportionately affected. So we're talking about rural hospitals, hospitals that serve socioeconomically challenged populations, populations that have historically had uh, what many of us would say is a severe underinvestment in healthcare. People who can least afford it get hit the hardest. Now, um, it is also the case that you see this uh, third point here. There are some other populations that are, in, you might say, enjoying having their health care records protected by very well resourced organizations, but they themselves are high profile enough to become targets. So, you know, you think about people who uh, live in, in high end places, uh, people who are have uh, intellectual property, especially in the technology innovation space, people who are in uh, politically sensitive roles or who have key roles in keeping the na national infrastructure going, heads of organizations, wealthy people, founders, academic experts, other types that would um, present tempting targets to the bad actors, maybe not just because of money, but for political reasons. The bad actors would get paid, but they're not so much interested in selling the um, health records of a governor of you know the state of, of uh, New York or something. They're not, it's not that they want to sell that on the dark web. It's that that is a, a political interest to certain states, certain uh, maybe also you know criminal organizations. So this space is changing. And uh, for now, you're better off in one of the big cities or somewhere that's got a, a well-financed hospitals uh, with, with IT department and cybersecurity. But that may change and may, may be already changing. So um, the uh, cybersecurity threats change, sometimes change quickly. So I give you an example here. Um, we have a, a, a new, well, not super new, but a, a type of threat that if you had gotten your training 20 years ago would be, would be quite novel when you encountered it. There are uh, ways of compromising people's machines. And the, um, when, when, this, the, the, when this is done, the machine's uh, chip or a central processing unit is used to mine cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So that's all they really do with your machine. You're, you know, you think like, hey man, my machine sure is running slow. I, I, you know, why am I using Windows? This, this is, this is bad. There are instances where the reason why your machine is running very slowly is because your machine is compromised. It's considered a zombie computer. It still w works, but your uh, chip will get used uh, as part of these mathematical algorithms that the person who controls your zombie machine uses to do cryptocurrency mining. So we're not gonna go into cryptocurrency mining today. It's just that people make money mining Bitcoin and mining Ethereum and doing this stuff. And the more computers you have doing it, the more money you can make. So this is the kind of threat that kind of came out of the blue to a lot of people. If, if you didn't know what Bitcoin was, I mean, a lot of people feel like I still don't know what it is. I still don't understand the underlying blockchain technology. Well, I'll just say that information security professionals, uh, cybersecurity professionals, they got to keep up with stuff. There's a lot to know about. They have to embrace learning curves. There's new areas of cybersecurity that just didn't even exist 10 years ago. So, you know, innovation, experimentation, and sandboxing seem to be on the side of the bad actors and criminals. I think that's just a, the fundamental thing here. We play defense. They're trying new techniques out. They read about a vulnerability and try to turn it into the thing that we all fear, which is called the zero day exploit, where before Microsoft has got a patch ready, the, the bad actors are already going in and uh, using, turning that vulnerability into an exploit and, and um, compromising computers, stealing passwords and all the rest of it. So key point here is that governments are involved in some of these advanced hacking techniques so it's one thing to get financing for innovation because you've got paid ransomware. 
It's another thing when you have, like, say, the Russian or Chinese government actually financing some uh, advanced hacking groups, which is what we think happened with the solar winds, uh, the solar winds threat, uh, or I should say the solar winds compromise, which the, the story going around right now is that an intern had set up some stupid password like one, two, three, four, and that they, they brute forced that maybe, um, which is not that if you're going to brute force the try a password, that's the first thing you would do. You would use the word password, then you would use one, two, three, four. So what can we do about it? this well it kind of depends on who you are and what your what your role is i'm tempted to say cybersecurity is for everyone but i don't believe that i don't think doctors and nurses should be dealing with it more than they absolutely have to they shouldn't have to go to meetings about it they shouldn't have to be retrained on it i mean maybe they do maybe they fundamentally do but we it's a failure that a clinician who should be spending time healing people and got trained to save lives is spending time going to more meetings about passwords, more meetings about spear phishing and ransomware and all the rest of it. My positive vision uh, for a sort of humanistically better informed medical system is one where doctors aren't spending as much time looking at screens. Nurses are spending less time with their devices they're they're touching patients and helping them heal they're doing what they were trained to do and using as little information technology as possible so they're re-engaging with the patient as a whole person a person with a, a past and a future and the the technology enables this it doesn't get in the way right right now we're in this technocratic phase where doctors are spending all this time on screens they see one patient for 15 minute minutes and then you know adjust their dosage of drug and move on to the next patient 43 patients that day this kind of thing looking at screens looking at screens looking at apps thinking about passwords looking at emails all this stuff and what i want to see is us move to a medical system where this is not the defining characteristic for the clinicians because the tech is working so that they don't have to use as much tech well as such i really don't want to ask them to spend more time thinking about security than they have to. As it is, last Thursday, I invited a, a physician colleague onto a um, call with uh, our uh, data science versus COVID team for this exact reason, thinking about security of some software, because I felt like, okay, someone's got to be talking about this stuff. So I, I'm contradicting my own ideals, okay? Having said that, there are some things that we can embrace now, yesterday, and a key one is called secure DevOps or Sec DevOps. I learned about this from a, a guy I'm uh, privileged to call my friend from Austin, Jose Alvarez, who runs the Secure DevOps Meetup group. He may be on this call. He's a real busy guy, and his Meetup group changed my way of thinking about developing software. What it does is it forces the discussion early as possible. It, it someone ends up bringing up security as early as it should be brought up. And maybe other people think, why are we talking about this this early? We don't even have the software developed. Why are we talking about security? That's how secure DevOps tries to get people to change at the individual level, as well as the group level, and maybe the culture level. The idea here is that if we are thinking about this very early, and there's someone advocating for security at the earliest possible stage, then we're going to end up making software that's likely going to be less vulnerable. So, um, you know, here's a way of thinking about what it is. It's, uh, you know, if, if DevOps is, is uh, bringing in things like agile development to IT and, and getting more and more people in the world of information technology to understand what code is and what code can do and how to develop it and, and people are embracing the learning curve then what secure devops is doing is getting us to embrace the learning curve of software development that needs to be security oriented from the earliest stages possible so just last week i was the person who really foregrounded this issue in this uh, development project i'm part of a team i'm leading and I got pushback, you know, from a very good friend. Just why are we talking about security? Uh, you know, we don't, we shouldn't need to worry about security. This this uh, application, there's there's no real 
only hypothetical reasons to be afraid of it. I'm like, well, okay, maybe, but we got, we need to talk about this. Let's not assume that. And so we kind of went back and forth in this meeting and I got my friend Jose to advocate for why people in hospitals and, and uh, healthcare organizations should as much as possible be not building too much software too quickly without having some very serious discussions as early as possible about the security angles for it. So it's a change in mentality. It slows things down. It takes up time and money and oxygen to have to think about this stuff. But um, a, a, a development team I was with about 15 years ago, I remember one of the developers saying to me, uh, the security holes in this app are so big, you can drive the entire world through them. What we were doing, I was a tester. I was, I was testing this app and trying to get it to break and see how it would break. And we were gonna pass it all along to the security team, the security guys later. And we, we couldn't, none of us were being paid to think about security, but I think we've, this has got to change. So there is a particular type of auditing that organizations can use to measure and uh, get reports on the safeguards that an organization such as a hospital are doing. Are, are, is an organization doing due diligence with regard to patient data? How do we know? How do we measure this? What's the risks involved in how the data architecture exists? How much of the data could be exposed if there is a, a breach? And uh, how would we know if there's a breach and, and how many breaches have there been? And, and what does that tell us about the probability that there will be data breaches in the future? Are we investing in our systems? Are we investing in our people? Are we underinvesting? I mean, you'd like to have it be done exactly in the middle, right? Like the Goldilocks principle, not too hot, not too cold. Well, you don't want to spend too much money on due diligence reporting about data protections, but you definitely don't want to spend too little. And that's probably what we've been doing. Again, the nice big hospitals, uh, like say Johns Hopkins, which is you know a, a leading healthcare institution, they've got the nice stuff. They've got people who think about this data protections and, and try to maybe be a little proactive about using some new tech, doing it right, blocking and tackling at the very least, just doing the basics. Organizations that have fewer resources don't do these audits. They're in reactive mode and their patients are people who can least afford uh, the consequences of a breach to both their um, personal identity and just to their sanity. I mean, if, you're, if you worry about stuff and a lot of people worry so we see from the rise of uh, diagnoses of, of uh, anxiety and major depressive disorder and this kind of thing in recent years, getting a letter saying that your data has been breached and that we don't, the organization doesn't really know that it's, its impact. How, what does that do for your, your mental health? So um, let me just throw out some possible ways that we might get ahead of the curve and stop playing defense as much. So uh, within EFF Austin, we've had a, a meeting with just a few of us on using the technologies that are referred to as machine learning to maybe do some analysis, to build tools that would allow organizations to determine the type of threats that they're facing. So there's, there's a lot of threats out there, but a lot of them are kind of like the equivalent of a, um, a burglar that just checks every car door in a neighborhood at, at you know, one in the morning uh, for, for uh, an unlocked door. So it's not your car that they're after, it's just a car and they, it's just kind of generic. So there's a lot of that kind of, uh, you might say that type of threat vector where it's nothing personal about your organization or your computer. It's just that you've got a botnet that is doing attacks on a series of computers, maybe all over the world. It just goes after a series of them. That could be quite dangerous, but that is different than what we would call an advanced threat or um, an advanced persistent threat. So let's say a particular organization reads about you as a um, healthcare finance head or a uh, chief of clinical informatics at um, you know, a major hospital in New York City, they find, read about you as an individual because of a news story. They figure out what your email is. And they send you a, a crafted email that is designed to fool you into thinking it's from a colleague. 
that spear phishing, that would be an advanced threat, something like this. That's just not the same as like a kind of random hacker organizations that are just trying every computer in a series and seeing if there's any vulnerabilities on some port. So you can also have an advanced persistent threat where they don't just send you the spear phishing email once to try to get some ransomware uh, code installed in your in your uh, hospital uh, network. It's more that they try a series of spear phishing type of attacks and they are researching your organization, learning about it, find, finding prominent individuals. You get an email saying, did you go to, you know, um, Dr. Gonzalez talked today. I thought she did a great job. What's your reaction to it? Why don't you click here and give us your uh, feedback on her, her speech on how we can enhance drug discovery. So you're like, yeah, I thought that was a great talk. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I definitely wanna give some feedback and you click on it and that's where the ransomware comes into your organization. So machine learning techniques, machine learning technologies, do hold out a lot of premise, uh, a lot of promise, I should say, for this. There's There are commercially available products. I think there's probably open source products for doing threat assessments. And if, if anyone on this call wants to, you know, uh, confab on this particular issue, we, we did have one meeting, you know, with some EFF Austin guys, including uh, Kevin um, and Chris Boyd and Dave Damaris. And I would love to, to be educated on the topic. It's very interesting. I think there's opportunities for innovation and there are tools out there right now. Uh, Dark Trace, I think is um, one particular company um, that, that's doing this, you know, where machine learning crosses over to cybersecurity. The, um, so a lot of people are interested in blockchain based ways of securing patient medical records to, there is one system I've read about that has been used to do this. Uh, it's the prototype of it called MedRec. And that's developed by John Halamka, who's a, a thought leader in medical technology. He's a, a clinician who has the, the reputation of being the geek doctor. And they went ahead and they got a working blockchain system running to secure real patient data in a real hospital, I think in Boston. Now, blockchain is the technology underlying uh, Bitcoin and many, many other applications. I think ultimately it's going to be a lot more important than cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Blockchain is one of a series of distributed databases with amazing encryption capabilities that can present the most secure type of encryption or some of the most secure encryption that we, we've ever developed before. So, it is quite interesting to think about having blockchain-based security for your records to know that they aren't being tampered with. That would be maybe the obvious, most obvious use case. It's not that it's not going to be so much password protection here. It's more to know that your data was ever accessed or, or altered. You can guarantee the immutability of data through blockchain. So I think this is quite interesting. I, I went to a talk uh, so IBM guys gave on IBM's blockchain app. There's many, many blockchain platforms and apps coming from companies large and small, and then you know open source and maybe um, non-commercial entities are doing research in this in universities. Interesting, I don't see this as something that's gonna help me or you keep our data, healthcare data secure like this year, maybe next year. I don't know. I mean, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, please. I mean, I, I would love to, to hear like hospitals in Austin say are, are have already moved on this and it's it's not just R&D, but in production. I just don't see this as the thing that's going to solve our problems anytime soon. Maybe it will be part of the solution. So um, there's a big picture here, big picture idea here. So some of you know that medical students get trained to use a, uh, an advanced digital technology called facsimile machines. Faxing, it is digital, okay? So you're a 25 year old medical student and you remember like when you were seven years old, your, your uncle got a fax, okay? So that technology never went away, especially because that's how hospitals and clinics send patient data around. They get the paper form of the data and they fax it over. That goes on all the time. 
I don't see any reason to think it's going to go away anytime soon. I, I fully expect by the end of this decade, there's going to be lots of doctors faxing stuff around. Maybe hope, hope I'm wrong. This is not efficient at all. So you have the paper data that gets faxed routinely in hospitals and uh, healthcare organizations and clinics. And then there's all kinds of digital data. There's records of that time you went to the dentist. There's records of that time you were treated for appendicitis on a, on a trip in Wisconsin. There's bits of data about you all over the place. It's one would like to know what, what and where it is. Well, the point about HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, is that entities do have obligations under federal law to help you both protect your data, uh, to keep it private, um, and um, also that it's portable, that you have access to it. So the accountability here means that you, as a citizen and as a person who got medical care, you have a right to your own data and your data should be kept secure. If, if there's a breach, that organization uh, will send letters about a HIPAA violation. It's quite expensive. The Office of Civil Rights is the federal entity uh, that, that actually deals with HIPAA violations as does uh, Health and Human Services, HHS. So while you can hire um, a uh, health, not Heath, data analyst to find your records, um, the organizations are involved are supposed to be good faith actors. They're, they are supposed to play ball here. They are supposed to help you find your stuff. They're supposed to be cooperative. If, if you are a customer, if they've got your data, if they know something about your healthcare records, they are supposed to be cooperative. So I'm saying, to, you know, you can call Epic, which is the, the major electronic health record company in America. Uh, you can call Cerner, which is the second biggest electronic health record company in America, and talk to them and ask them to see if you can get, get some cooperation. When I call Cerner and hit zero to get the operator, I don't get anybody um, picking up, I'm, I'm dismayed to say. Um, and while maybe they're cash strapped, uh, they got like a $12 billion contract by the VA, that's B with billion, $12 billion to uh, upgrade the Veterans Administration's electronic health record system from the legacy one called Vista to the new Cerner platform. I think they can afford to have a person answer the phone, uh, an actual humanoid answer the phone when you hit zero, but that's, I'm old fashioned, I know. So um, what else can we say? Consider joining us here at EFF Austin. We have a cybersecurity working group, just three of us, uh, Chris Boyd, Kevin Welch and myself. We've met with uh, Travis County, uh, information security officials and, and their uh, heads of information technology and, and other, other folks over there to try to convey some concerns about how they had their stuff configured prior to the um, election. And we're pleased to say that there's certainly haven't heard that there was any problems with Travis County voting machines or their servers in the uh, November election. And they, they really made us think that they were taking this stuff very, very seriously, I'm glad to say. So we've had a couple meetings. If you're interested in volunteering, we are EFF Austin. You could be a volunteer for our cybersecurity work group. We have lots of work to do. We have lots that we want to learn about. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, time for questions. I will. Um, well, there's absolutely time for questions, even ignoring that this is not limited like cat factory by we get booted out at nine. So, you know, it's our room. I, it ends when I say it ends. But uh, no, we have uh, we booked you till like nine nine fifteen on the schedule, so uh, plenty of time for questions. Okay, I I do yeah I did want to end on a kind of a quasi positive note that you know you can <laughs> could get involved. You can get involved with organizations like National EFF or you know EFF Austin and the um, EFA, which is yeah, yes national. I oh yes I forgot to mention at the very beginning, but to make clear. Let's say you go, well, I'm not really based in San Fran. I'm not really based in Austin. Yeah, virtual while COVID's going on, but when real world returns, I'm not really in any of those places. Well, you should look into the Electronic Frontier Alliance or the EFA. It is a, gr uh, a group of affiliated organizations that EFF has put together in the last couple of years that basically, basically EFF was originally intended to be a chapters-based organization way back in the early days. They ultimately didn't go that route, but EFA is sort of a kind of 
we're not chapters of EFF and we don't take marching orders from them. It's a far more peer-to-peer -peer internet enabled form of activism where there's a whole bunch of affiliate groups all over the country who are aligned with EFF's mission. And so we all kind of work together in the alliance to advance these issues, particularly because EFF's focus is primarily on national legislation. They aren't necessarily aware of everything going on in every state and every city. In fact, EFF Austin has brought numerous bills of the Texas legislature to EFF's attention that they had no clue was happening until we told them about it. And like they've had many oh shit moments when they realized what uh, our lovely ledge was up to on certain things. So yes, there's probably an EFA chapter where you live. And so you can get involved with your fellow geeks and cyberpunks. Though weirdly enough, we're the only EFA member in Texas. So if you live elsewhere in Texas, we're the best you have, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you don't just have to live in Austin to help out that, with EFF Austin. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Some of y'all will have come to our party that we have. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to have a 2021 party, um, but South by Southwest isn't happening anytime soon. But, you know, uh, feel free to engage us. Uh, we have people all across the country that, you know, former Austinites or people who know what we're doing. And our, our work is complementary to our uh, much better resourced uh, friends over at EFF National um, in San Francisco. And, but we, we know them. I mean, they come and meet with us occasionally, maybe once a year. And uh, they're a great organization. They do really good work. They're really the premier digital civil liberties and privacy protection and cyberspace organization in the world, the original one. Uh, but we have lots of opportunities for volunteers, not just on cybersecurity. That's just one piece here. Um, um, li literally anything. Um, we're, we're definitely a, uh, you know, community driven organization, you know, a distributed little anarchist tinge to it all. So like I always joke, we do what the volunteers want us to do because we are the volunteers. So if you're like, why isn't EFF Austin doing that? It's like, well, be the person doing it. I'm not the gatekeeper of this org. Talk with me. We'd, we'd love to look into it. <laughs> the, well, well put, Kevin. So um, on the particulars about the value of data, patient data and medical data on the dark web and hospital cybersecurity and, and some of that stuff, I'm very eager to engage people who know lots and lots and lots about this stuff. So if anyone on this call sees um, blind spots, you know, or knows any of these pieces better than I do, I mean, I, I please school me. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm I very, very eager to, to learn more. Um, I learn more about it all the time. There's a lot to know about. So um, I would just encourage anyone who is a sort of technical expert in cybersecurity, um, whether you're part of EFF Austin already or, or just not, uh, to consider come and giving a talk in this series, come uh, being part of our work group and, uh, and you know, letting us know how we can all be mutually supportive. So there is this idea of sort of citizens grassroots armies that are supportive of efforts that governments are not doing a great job on and maybe private organizations are not necessarily doing a great job on. So with cybersecurity, you know, whose responsibility is it? I, I don't want to say it's everybody's, but I would say if, if you're not a doctor or a nurse, bring your A-game, step up, use two-factor two authentication at the very least to protect your own stuff. If you're in the healthcare world, then I would just ask you to um, bite the bullet and, and learn as much of, about good cyber, hy cyber hygiene as you can, good password protection, understanding where the threats are. You probably have to actually now, HR will make you do a yearly um, you know, cybersecurity education module, which I, I reluctantly say probably is a good move that HR has done here. I wish doctors didn't have to think about this stuff. I wish nurses didn't have to do this. So the rest of us should pick up the slack. And um, if you've got healthcare professionals in your family, among your colleagues, and you know about cybersecurity and information security, then, you know, volunteer to help, to educate and, and understand what the particulars, particular challenges are that they're facing. Yeah, so uh, anybody got questions for Owen? Um, let's try not to have a crazy free for all. So, I mean, you know, Zoom etiquette, raise your hand if you have a question, though. Uh, ah, I, I see one. Uh, Mike there. Hey, Ellen, good to see you. Great talk. Um, oh, hey, Mike. So uh, 
I had a question. It seems like there's a, at least to me, what seems like a pretty obvious deterrent that's very low tech. And that is, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, but it, what it is, is a law that makes it illegal for any US citizen or company to make a bribe to a foreign company. Because it, prior to that act in 1977, so much US capital was being spent to bribe foreign governments, foreign officials uh, in order to do business in other countries. And now it's a criminal act to do so. It seems like something analogous to that. If the government were to make it illegal to actually pay a ransomware or pay a bribe uh, for ransomware, it would seriously cut down on the number of uh, ransomware attacks in the United States. And um, I was wondering if you've heard of there's any traction on upon that realm. Uh, Mike, you know, you consistently have have interesting things to say uh, over the time I've known you. And I have to say, I, I absolutely had not thought of this at all. I, I've, heard, I've I've certainly seen references to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, if that's what it's the FCPA or something. But uh, I've never thought about it reference to ransomware. I I will steal your idea and uh, and tell people I thought of it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I, I, I don't have any any. Uh, good reason to think why why we haven't uh, done this already. I think the, the thing is, is that establishing the identity of the bad actors can be murky. So by the time the hospital pays the ransom where it's like, who are these guys? They're coming out of the tour maybe, or they're, you know, they're not going to say, you know, um, that they're, you know, proud um, Ukrainian. <laughs> no, no, I, what I'm saying is you don't, don't, it's not illegal to pay a foreign ransomware. It's apparent, illegal to pay any ransomware. So if you pay, if you're an American company or institution and you pay a ransomware, you violate a criminal law. And by doing that, it seems like that would cut down on this drastically with the, is a very low tech solution. I guess the attorney general, it doesn't go after the hospitals because they're the ones that pay the ransomware, are the ones who are often in worse shape. I mean, that's my guess. I'm speculating here. If, if anybody knows the answer to this, that's a really interesting observation. I think there's this oh, idea. A bit about that. And I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand because I can't figure out how to do the raise my hand. I'm Maureen Van Devender and I do uh, research into medical device cybersecurity risk. And, and I, I don't know specifically what the laws are, but there, there is some laws about paying a terrorist organization. And so, you know, if you could establish that they were paying an organization that was a, a, an organization that funds terror, then it would be illegal. But then the other thing is, if if they made it illegal, then it could potentially uh, result in a loss of life in the case of healthcare. You know, if they if they pay the ransom and get them get themselves back up in business, that it could it could reduce the possibility that there would be a loss of life in the hospital. Yeah, those, I, are, those are just two issues that I know of. Yeah, and I guess I'll just you know add, uh, giving kind of my own research in EFFV of Paulson's view. First of all, I'll say. Uh, Thank you at the very least for thinking outside of the box. I had not heard somebody propose that as a possible solution. I do think Marines raised the uh, obvious potential downside with that solution. I will say that EFF and EFF Austin have really focused on, we view the major solution as um, essentially mandating mandatory uh, backups and images of computers, um, potentially by law, because that's the guaranteed try and true way to render a ransomware attack powerless. And it doesn't necessarily have the, uh, the moral dilemma that uh, Marine raised with the other solution. But I do want to thank you for the creative idea. I, I'd never heard somebody propose that before. So thank you for that. It also just tickles me because you mentioned that, that act. And I recall hearing through my mom from her talking about her dad who did uh, some kind of uh, government defense contract work for Bell Helicopter in Iran in the 70s. And yeah, he told my mom that just like, Oh yeah, you bribe people to get stuff done around here. That's how it works. So it's it's interesting you raised that they made that illegal shortly after he was there. <laughs> Hi, uh, Maureen. I'd like to engage you a little bit further. I'm, I'm, I appreciate you 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 uh, coming here and giving some some insights. I'm I'm curious what your sense is about ethics. It seems flamingly unethical for an organization to pay ransom to um, a criminal organization. I mean, I, I understand why they do it. They don't like to have to make this choice. It's a horrible dilemma that they're in. Uh, but the trade-offs are, are so bad. It's, it's, you, you, you are transferring risk from your own organization and your own patients uh, to the world. So it's an externality that incentivizes beha bad behavior in the future that gives the criminal organizations more resources. And 
I just don't understand why this, the ethical part of this is not foregrounded more um, in terms of just, I guess, maybe it is. I mean, t tell me what your thoughts are on this. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. But in my, my thought on my thoughts on that are human nature. And when, when you are in the situation where you have been ransomed, you're, you're in a, um, your, your decision-making in crisis is what they call that making decisions in crisis and you um, survival mode kicks in. And so organizations maybe tend to try to um, protect themselves or get themselves back up and running as soon as possible. The clock's ticking, money's, money's going, you know, going, um, reputation, patient health, all of these factors are happening at one time. So I can see why people would make those, what, what I agree with you completely is unethical decisions to um, save them in the moment. But, the, but the, the downside to making that, if, even if you take away the ethics, is if, if you um, pay the ransom and they also give you your data back or unlock your data, which is not a guarantee, um, how do you know they haven't, how do you know they're gone, right? The only, you're, you're, you're making a deal with a, an unethical organization. How do you know they've left your system? How do you know that they didn't also take your data and they're going to sell it to somebody else? that they certainly would have a big incentive to do that. And how do you know they didn't leave something in your system that they're going to ransom you again next week or next year? And, and the, the, the fact is you don't know that. So in more support for your idea that the ransom should not be paid is once your system has been compromised to that degree, I don't think you want it back. You need to rebuild it, restore it from some good point of that you knew was before was clean and move on and, and accept the consequences for that. So, so I agree with you on that, but I think organizations probably just really make bad decisions. They might be good decisions for the individual organization at the moment, but they're, they're bad for a number of reasons. Like you said, it's bad for the world. It, 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 bolsters, it bolsters criminals. And um, it also, it leaves you with a system that might appear to be working okay correctly today but it doesn't mean that it's clean. And your, your data is lost. You've lost your data anyway, as far as them being able to sell it to somebody else. That's a done deal. That's already happened. I mean, so cloud, I cloud computing to some extent will be gradually solving some of the problem of having backup data. You know, as, as we embrace it, um, maybe say by the end of this decade, I could expect most hospitals with cloud computing systems to have a big piece of this, the backup part of this that Kevin's alluding to figured out. So yeah. you don't have to have the staff to figure it out because the cloud computing people will figure it out for you. We're not there yet, but uh, I just, um, it's the organizations that pay the ransom um, are the ones who in a way, uh, they suffer the reputational loss, yeah. uh, it becomes public generally and um, then pe people don't trust that organization and all the work of you know a hundred years of an organization's mission of service and caring for people will be severely compromised for this um, I think very narrow-minded uh, and very short-sighted decision I, I agree. but on the other hand you know if, if I were an executive in that dilemma I, I hope I'd make the right decision yeah we had a hospital in our area that had a, uh, a ransom where attack and they did not pay the ransom and they just did a business continuity plan and they were still able to take care of their patients. I think they weren't, they weren't taking anybody in through the ER, but it took them weeks to get completely back up and going. So it, yeah. it's a long time and it's expensive, but it's probably not as expensive as the ransom would have been. And you're right about reputation, but I think possibly the reputation damage would be reputation in your industry with, with other hospitals more so than with patients because people don't know. You know, people, people don't, don't know that they paid the ransom or even what that means. We see when, when, um, when uh, businesses have huge data breaches like Target, which was definitely, you know, you know they, they made some mistakes that caused that to happen. It hurt their stock and it hurt their, their business for a very short period of time, but that turned around pretty quickly. People have a short memory for those things. If you were a um, member of a healthcare system or hospital and you knew that ransomware was paid and this does not get leaked to the press or to the general public, 
you could, I think, act as a whistleblower and be protected under federal law as a whistleblower when you going forward with that information. I believe that's true. I have not seen that happen, but it probably has. And I just, you know, don't track all this, this stuff at a granular level. But I do fear that um, the incentives are not properly aligned for hospitals to do the right things. Now, part of this, I think, goes back to that hospital IT is all bolted on top of billing. Going back, the further back you go in time, we, we bolted the clinical stuff on top of billing systems. And the, 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 the billing, the clinical stuff is very, very valuable. And for them to lose that, it's, it's gonna be cheaper to pay the ransomware, just I think from a sort of a dollar standpoint and hope that they get their data back uh, versus losing all that clinical data, which is just extraordinarily valuable. You know, so we've got to have some type of mitigation, I think, Probably federal law or the states can uh, move laws forward here, but probably needs to be federal law where hospitals are incentivized to not pay the ransomware anymore. And, and Mike, maybe it's the particular uh, statute that you referenced. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. And in, in in, that it has to be regulation or people are not going to comply or organizations are not going to completely comply. But maybe the way they step that regulation in which gives the hospital plenty of time to prepare for, if that does happen, how they would move forward and not pay the ransom. Yeah. I'm just gonna mention a, a couple other pieces here, which I didn't wanna stuff everything in the world into this, into this talk, you know, less is better, less is more most of the time. So two other interesting angles on this is that there's a maturation of cyber insurance. So I did some research on this uh, and, that market is becoming more sophisticated. They're basically aligning pricing such that policies can be offered that are attractive. And the costs of data breaches and hacking is, has been measured fairly well. And it, it's, it's a kind of thing now, we, we kind of know what it will cost you if this happens, or we can estimate at least the order of magnitude. So the cyber insurance market as it's matured and they've figured out how to productize their actuarial models of risk uh, hospitals and organizations are signing up for this and there's a secondary insurance market also where the cyber insurers themselves buy insurance for in the secondary markets um, that's how they have their risk kind of um, mitigated you know so if, if they have to do a big payout they've got uh, a policy that that would help them keep doing business if a really unusually big payout happened. So having cyber and cybersecurity policies reflect doing it right, investing in the right metrics and people and uh, technology and training. So you're, in other words, your rates come down as you're able to demonstrate to the, your cyber insurer, hey, we are doing the right thing. We're investing in training. We've got the, the people, we're, we're uh, being a little bit proactive if possible. They should give you a better policy for the same reasons that a 60-year-old um, church lady drives a Buick to church once a week, cheaper insurance policy than an 18-year-old who drives a red Ferrari and, and already got a DWI the first week after they got their you know, license. So the actuarial models should be reflecting the investments that hospitals need to do and, and doing it right should eventually lower your rates. The second piece is just the, the journalism part of this. So there's been a defunding of journalism since Facebook and, and Google decimated the uh, advertising markets. I think that news organizations are hiring cheaper people with less credentials and letting veterans go, letting the veterans retire. So getting deep reporters who really know this stuff and aren't thinking about a, a cyber breach as a local news story, just, uh, but thinking about it as like, what chain is this hospital part of? Are they part of a, a, a network? Are they, are they owned like HCA or they're part of a nationwide, um, you know, for-profit group? A, a good reporter will know this kind of stuff. I'm seeing, uh, I will mention the Wall Street Journal in particular is impressing me with some of their reporting on medical cybersecurity issues. So we really do need to see thought leaders and experienced veteran reporters emerging to get uh, their own professional ethos in this vertical better uh, established. Like if you're a, a brand new reporter covering cybersecurity, you need to, to be able to know who the 
the the people who are who are the deep experts, and we want to keep those deep experts reporting and as comp adequately compensated full time professionals who spend decades on this beat. And there are a few of these people out there. I would like to see more of those people out there so they can. They're the people who would find out. They'd get the tip if there was a ransomware payout that the public doesn't know about. So that's just a whole other piece of this. There's many, many, many pieces. Yeah, you're right. And in local communities, the loss of newspapers and and, and really if you look at the, the news, the media coverage in, in our local communities, it's going down because of that. It's defunding, being consolidation in the industry, and they're not paying experienced people enough money to keep them around. Yeah, and I'll just say, yeah, I, th I think <clears throat> very good points raised, though, and I'll just say just two things in response real quick. One, very interesting, you mentioned uh, cyber insurance, because actually my friend uh, Talia de Bramo um, is, is in the cyber insurance industry, and I, you even just reminded me that I'd been meaning to try to coax her into coming giving us a talk about the emerging area of cyber insurance as, as a Let's do it. market. So. And now maybe I won't be able to get her. Maybe she'll send a friend or colleague or something. But I'd been it been on my radar for a couple of years. That I remember it like blew my mind when she first mentioned it to me. And I'm like, of course that's a thing. But I'd never literally never heard of it until you told me that. So um, yes, it's been on my radar, and we definitely want to do that. And two, I'll just second. Yes, um, more and better reporting needs to be done on this um, in general. The, you know, reliable news uh, in the internet. It's it's a problem. People have not fully cracked yet and somebody really needs to. I, I guess just I'll put my EFF soapbox on and say that, you know, the 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 wrong solution is what we're seeing in like Australia right now, where they are essentially trying to propose link taxes yet again. Europe tried that a few years ago. Now Australia is trying it and they're using that everybody rightfully is pissed at Facebook and Google to disguise the fact that it's just backdoor link taxes again, which is not, you know, we need quality journalism, but link taxes are actually going to hurt the little blog, you know, a great deal. So we need to figure out a solution that's not that. I don't have it. If, if you're in this chat and you do have it, we need quality journalism, but uh, all people seem all the big news orgs just keep proposing link taxes and that's not gonna solve this problem, but it is a crisis. And a lot of it's just that the people who are always reporting the cybersecurity stuff, just they're not working for news orgs and they're not known to the wider public. Like, I mean, I, I know about like brilliant geniuses like Bruce Schneier and I can follow his blog and get news, but the average person in a small town's like, Bruce Schneier, who's the hell is that? So that's half the problem right there that doesn't matter if I know who we should be listening to, if ordinary people don't know who they should be listening to. Um, I definitely would love anyone who, who would recommend particular reporters, um, either you know locally, I would love to know who in Austin in, uh, who's in the media is, is thinking about this. Well, but it also used just, to be John Lepkowski way back in the 90s, but he don't work for the Chronicle no more. <laughs> this is true. Um, uh, you know, the, the journalism has got to be paid for. And uh, journalism about medical cybersecurity and whether hos what hospitals are doing the right thing, which hospitals are doing the wrong thing, and you know who's getting by and just hoping, you know, whistling past the graveyard because they're absolutely not prepared for a breach versus who should get some kudos. One of the problems with cybersecurity is that, is with us, with regard to hospitals, but organizations in general, is that you're paying for something that if you do it right, nothing happens. Right. So that, it's that's just, right? yeah, it, that's, that's just, there's a, a perverse incentive here. It's like, so, you know, what's your success story? Nothing happened. Well, I mean, if you, if you prevented breaches from happening in five years, okay, you should, you should get a, you know, merit badge, to, or, you know, or pro promotion, but that's the kind of thing that it does not appeal to a lot of executives. They're like, okay, you, you want us to invest how much money in cybersecurity training? Um, so, Similarly with reporters, I just don't think, um, I, I just don't have a sense that in, in Austin that we've got like a crack team of smart, techie, uh, informed reporters that are looking at medical cybersecurity. I, I think I would have heard about them by now, but please tell me I'm wrong. And if you're, if you're one of them on this call, I, you know, we'll buy you a beer and, and, and try to pick your brains. Nationally, as I was mentioning, there's some people in the Wall Street Journal that are doing really good work on this. And then in the tech press, there's some of it. So it's kind of some people who are writing for healthcare other people who are writing for tech and they're not all reading the same stuff. Uh, there's some overlap there. I, I mean, oh, and I, uh, 
first of all, I'll just say that uh, Mike recommended uh, Howard Solomon from IT World Canada. Um, so he might be a resource worth looking into. Yeah, he does a daily briefing you can get on your smart speaker um, oh, and it's okay. really good. It's very well balanced and um, good mix of technical, non-technical, but really covers all the latest cybersecurity threats. Uh, and, okay. also, and also I'll just say that there's um, there's a number, I of course I blank on his name, but there's a very good uh, resource that Chris Boyd on our board has recommended to me. And our, oh, uh, Richard, Richard uh, Forno, who we met. Oh, uh, Matt Matt Tate is in, is another good resource to yeah. follow. He's he's on Twitter, and uh, you're going to get a lot of good quality information from him. And of course, Kevin, I'll, Kevin, can you put those in the chat? Oh yeah, sure, we'll do. And also, I'll put uh, Bruce Schneier is the one I always uh, uh, shout out Schneier on security. Uh, he's on EFF's board. He's a Harvard fellow, and he's by some people considered the world's foremost cybersecurity expert. And I tend to agree with his takes on most things in this area. And I guess, oh, and I'll just also sidebar and say that um, I can tell you at least there's a few reporters in Austin who care about. EFFE -E sort of issues in general, because I'm occasionally contacted by reporters and have done st stories for them. I can get you those people's names, though I can't promise they're necessarily still in news or at the same news organization as the last time I spoke to them. But I, I mean, I remember like right before the pandemic, I, I spoke with a reporter, the, uh, the Sutherland Springs shooting incident was in the news and, um, you know, basically local law enforcement wanting encryption backdoors to hack into the phone of the shooter. And so I went on to uh, give the good fight of encryption backdoors are a bad idea. So um, there are people who care about these issues. Um, just, uh, I don't know if there's necessarily your crack team you desire, but there are some reporters who care. Well, we should make the crack team. We should figure out which <laughs> bloggers, academics, and reporters know different pieces of this. So. I think um, I don't want to quite say this is all hands on deck, except it probably is. <laughs> this situation is getting worse um, every year. It's I don't see any evidence it's turning around or about to get better. Um, at some point, there's probably going to be some really tragic results. If, and I mean, I think at least one death has been attributed to a criminal organization shutting down a surgery center. I don't think that was in America. I think that was in Europe. I do recall UK. saying that news story. You might even have been the one who shared it with me that we'd had our first definitely attributable death to a cyber hacking incident of a hospital. I think it was in Germany. Yeah, Germany. That, sound, that sounds right. So um, I, I think, Kevin, that we should have, uh, we should revisit this topic, say, in a, in a year and uh, have maybe a panel discussion and just try to find a deep heads, deep experts from uh, different domains, uh, you know, from the healthcare side, from the cybersecurity side, and may maybe some uh, reporters to talking about how the sausage gets made. In other words, how they find out what they find out. I mean, you know, uh, what tipsters are willing to go around the organizational uh, media firewall and and leak stuff out about a breach? Say, uh, that's that's very risky and potentially unethical. But then. You know, it really depends. You know, I, I would agree with you that, you know, the ethics are complicated. I would encourage a leaker to, you know, hopefully there's an ethical corporate culture and there are chains of elevation internally, but, you know, that doesn't always exist, you know, then that's why we, we had people like Edward Snowden, you know, because there's not always an internal culture to promote the leak that needs to happen. But, you know, I agree that I don't, I'm not an expert in the culture of uh, how that information gets out when something is being suppressed or hidden that really needs to be public knowledge. Well, just also, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna just say that, that because of our extremely odd duck relative to our peers healthcare system, which is fundamentally built on for-profit principles in a way that's anomalous compared to our peers, we have these corporations like HCA and others that they're just, they're big, big private corporations with the pro profit motive and Whatever commitment to ethics they believe in, whatever commitment to ethics they publicly publicly profess, things that are bad for business, when we were talking about information that's revealed, there's incentives. Um, I'm not talking about motives. I'm talking about incentives to not do the right thing and, uh, and fess up. So I just would really like to see reporters do the... Um, the, the, the thing that's attributed to Woodward and Bernstein, which what didn't really get said, but it follow the money. That's the simplest principle you can follow here. 
Um, I really want to know who those reporters are locally, state and nationally, who are doing the best work in this space, investigative journalism of whether hospitals are doing the right thing, adequately investing in the resources that they need. I can tell you, because I know this one piece quite well, we do not have enough trainers to train the talent. Absolutely not even close. We're not even anywhere near it. And, and we're, nationally, we're kind of flailing. Now, National Cyber Watch Center is trying to train the trainers and figure out how to get the, the educational talent to train the new cybersecurity people. And that's why the organization is doing what it's doing, you know, but, uh, but then on the reporting side, just uh, feel free. If you, if you know a resource, you'd mentioned uh, somebody, um, Howard Solomon. Okay. Thank you. That's a new one. And for Brian me. Krebs has been sharing the and chat. And, Krebs, actually, okay. and actually, oh, and now that I think about it, their beat is not specifically cybersecurity, but if you're just wanting good Austin based investigative journalists, I do have a few names I can give you. One is a gentleman named Ken Martin who founded the blog, The Austin Bulldog. He actually spoke at EFF Austin about five years ago. Um, he does excellent investigative uh, reporting. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's ethically based where, you know, he's you know, he's, he's reporting stuff that, you know, the public should probably be aware of, you know, even if he gets beyond just like the team playing, for instance. Like I remember he did an expose on um, former Austin council member, Jimmy Flanagan, you know, had a history of uh, bad debts. And, you know, on the one hand, I really liked a lot of the activism um, Mr. Flanagan did around police reform in Austin. But, you know, I was like, well, this is still information as a council member managing the budget the public should know about. Even if I'm willing to give him some slack because I really like the work he's doing, it's still vital public information. So Ken does a lot of good work there. Um, the other local resource, uh, although also to your point, Owen, uh, Ken is like, you know, in his 80s now. So like there aren't necessarily young people coming up in the industry. Um, one other uh, local resource, um, I know I had the name on the tip of my tongue. There is another, oh yes, um, our former board member, Kathy Mitchell, her husband, Scott Henson, runs an excellent blog called Grits for Breakfast that if you're looking for local, really quality reporting on, um, on criminal justice reform, there's no better local blog on that topic. So we do have some really good independent investigative journalists, but not necessarily specifically in the EFF Austin space. Okay, so. well, duly noted. Um, so uh, Kevin, do you wanna post the link to Gather Town? Um, oh, well, actually I can even do better than that. I have the... Uh, uh, Mr. Make Every Media himself, Mr. Mike Furstenfeld here to introduce the happy hour, actually. <laughs> oh, hey, I was just going to post the link, though. Yeah, well, you can do that. But also, <laughs> if you want to give people a little quick uh, shameless self-promotion about who you are, what you do, uh, you know, I figure we each can scratch each other's backs here because you oh, generously sure. offered this to us and just give people a little, I already told people roughly what this is, but if you want to give people a little quick rundown of what to expect, um, but yes, you're all welcome to join us for our virtual happy hour. And I guess I'll just also quickly say yes, Owen, though we should definitely revisit, we should have a panel. And I also just want to say that, um, you know, whenever we do have it, um, if Maureen, if you'd like to be involved in that, we'd, we'd love to have you because you clearly have a wealth of knowledge on this topic. So uh, we'd certainly be interested if you were interested. I would love to. I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to do my research. I don't work for a health organization. I work for a university, and, and, but I have contacts with health Well, I will just again post my email in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to me if you would ever like to talk or present on something in your expertise in this area. Because, uh, I mean, the biggest thing I do as current president of the board is I'm always trying to find interesting speakers. So, uh, you know, here you are. So uh, please get at me if you would like to talk. Yeah, um, I've got your stuff now. <laughs> I have another question. Um, oh, oh yeah, all right. Um, one final question before I turn things over to Mike. Sorry, Mike. Oh, sorry, sorry. So as the CTO, it is nearly impossible to find any details on how these attacks actually happen. All you hear is like 99% of what I'm investigating is, and then someone clicked on a link. Okay, they clicked on a link, then what happened? You know, it's okay, clearly they, it was a phishing scam. They got their credentials to perhaps their, their G Suite or, you know, some device. How does it then spread through the network? How do you harden against that? And there's I can find almost nothing on, on how this happens. And the, so as a CTO, it's like, okay, I can educate my people not to fall for phishing, but once they do, how do I then harden my network? And, and any suggestions you guys have as to further investigation or further uh, research or um, education there would be fantastic. I mean, 
I, um, oh, well, look here. Mr. J. Kluborg is saying you should read extrusion detection. So there, that sounds like some good advice. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Um, and I guess I'll just say, I don't work in InfoSec. That's not my specialty. I'm a full stack web programmer, though I'd like to think I know basic dumb things not to do like uh, SQL injection or uh, uh, Excel injection or all sorts of other fun uh, basic or cross-site scripting. You know, I, I know how to prevent the basic stuff. And in fact, I really wondered why I'm not a CTO when I'm reading that the CTO of Gab committed to their GitHub repo, a basic SQL injection, which is why they got hacked just the other day. So <laughs> mm, naughty, naughty. Um, but yeah. Uh, I have a question just about this kind of thing, and maybe Mike or uh, Kevin or somebody can answer. Does, is Microsoft do, using automated risk assessment tools for the code that lives on GitHub since they bought GitHub? Does anyone know? Not that I know of. I mean, I, I can put some crap up there and it doesn't flag it or anything like that. I mean, as far as, I mean, I don't know the answer to that to be completely blunt. I could speculate that it seems like something likely they might do, but I have not heard anything yay or nay. And um, I would think that an organization like Microsoft could really be a big part of the improve the improvement situation. Um, I mean, they've gotten way better on cybersecurity. Oh, I, definitely, I despite Microsoft their- Bad despite, joke. Well, despite their rightful 90s reputation as being awful, they've uh, they've made big strides at improvement. Uh, when modern Windows is actually, I mean, compared to 90s Windows, modern Windows is quite secure, though, you know, there's always room for improvement. But um, and I guess just, Mike, I, I, the final thing I would say is like, you know, it's, it's an interesting ask. I mean, firstly, what I would say, frankly, uh, get a chief security officer be my recommendation. Prioritize it at the C-suite of your organization, um, you know, security first. Um, but as far as, you know, as I said, I, I don't specialize in InfoSec, I'm just a programmer, but, you know, I'd, I'd encourage your employees to one, think about baking it into process from the very beginning. But I mean, I mean, another thing to do is, okay, so fine, they've, They've stolen somebody's username and password and they've gotten into the network. Well, you know, first of all, no user should, the default should be nobody has permission to access anything except the things they need to access to do their job. So just make sure that start from the default of every account's locked down and then grant permissions as necessary to be able to do your job. That will frankly help you a lot just doing that one thing. Like, you know, an intern should not have the same access you do as the CTO, like they shouldn't. So, you know, that may sound painfully obvious, but I know that bad uh, read, write, execute policy hoses a lot of orgs once they get compromised. So even something as simple as that, you're probably doing better than the average org. Yeah, well, we, we certainly have our IAM, it's all AWS and all of our IAMs are set to um, need only access. So it's, you know, we're certainly doing that, but I just, I, it's very difficult to find any information on practically how this happens once it gets inside the network. So I'll look at extrusion detection. If anybody else has any other recommendations I can put in the chat, I'd appreciate that. I mean, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I, as I said, and I, I frankly, I, you know, make sure there are infosec professionals working at your company who are trained in this. Make it, make it a department you hire for and that you don't, you know, I know it's tempting, especially if you have a small company of, oh, our money's precious, but, you know, prioritize hiring an expert in security sooner and later. And then, you know, because you, your job as a CTO, you're not, you don't need to be the ultimate expert at it, but you do need somebody working for you who is a huge expert at it. So I think that's number one. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, I just remember something about yeah, Amazon uh, Web Services. They had a feature uh, they rolled out in the, you know, their cloud that uh, would basically uh, kind of evaluate your VM and like kind of, you know, get a baseline feel for what its operation is. And yeah, if it does notice some, you know, things being, uh, yes. Suddenly, it's starting to open, you know, ports to uh, remote sites and things like that. Uh, then, yeah, some alert would be generated. But uh, I, I mean, it is a very, you know, kind of a blunt uh, instrument. You know, I mean, it may be a perfectly valid thing too. So, yeah, I really don't know how much the cloud people can do. I mean, this is fairly fine-grained behavior, and uh, subject matter experts, you know, I mean, they're the ones who will have to set up the right type of uh, guards. 
And to everyone uh, who uh, is here participating in our talk, I hope the vitalness of the major thesis of Owen's talk is hit home for you by that you have many highly trained software professionals, experts in this talk, and we're all admitting our ignorance about how to really deal with these problems if they happen. So if we aren't experts on this, what about people who don't even work in software? Like that should impress upon you how big a problem this is. All right, well, I interrupted uh, Mike of Make Every Media enough time. So let me actually let him give us a little spiel and introduce our happy hour here because we are actually running toward the end of our time here. So unless somebody yeah. has a final burning question, I'm gonna let Mike introduce it here. Feel free, I'm, it's, I'm cool with me. All right, I, I think it's you. I don't see any other questions, so go All ahead. All right, cool. Well, yeah, I'm uh, Mike, the creator of Make Every Media, and uh, we actually started out as a theater company like 10 years ago, and so we're coming from theater production, variety shows, music, events, and then making the transition over the last five years into more like media, movies, podcasts, apps, and then when the pandemic came around, had to dive headfirst into virtual events and conferences and things like that, um, and so we're still, we're still making podcasts uh doing as much as we can remotely um and safely uh but virtual events are are kind of kind of exciting times and and this what we're about to head into gather is so far the closest thing that we've found that is not in virtual reality that uh gives you that feeling of being in person with somebody you have freedom of movement you'll you'll be able to you know choose a rudimentary avatar uh, almost like 8-bit style and move around the space once you get in there using your keyboard and when you get close to people they pop up but there's also like uh, there's there's one-on-one -on -one tables if you want to just have a private conversation with somebody you can it's self-directed breakout rooms and there's also party games in there too if you come across an object that highlights yellow you can press x on your keyboard and uh, that is an embedded a game of some kind. Kevin and I played a few few rounds of uh, heated poker uh, on on there. Texas Texas Hold'em. There, there's nothing more heated than fake internet money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can buy in for you know free. So it's it's really no. But yes, thank you, Invader Zen. Uh, <laughs> so I pasted the the link in in the chat here. Um, and, and if somehow you guess, get booted from the room and later decide, oh, I actually wanted to go, the link is available in the uh, the meetup event, in the Facebook yeah. event. You can get to it through Twitter, which links to the meetup event. But the link is out there, although, you know, if you somehow miss it before we close the room here and decide to join us. Yeah, or just email makeeverymedia at gmail.com and I'll email you the link. Um, it's a little, you know, it's kind of newish technology. It's called video, uh, spatial video conferencing. And so it's browser based. So it's, it, you know, it's a little uh, quirky sometimes, but it works, it works for most people. And if, it, if, you, if it's not quite working for you, just try refreshing your browser. Make sure you, when you, when you first get on to enable like let gather you use your microphone and your webcam. It'll probably ask you. Um, and, and I guess just also say that to the note yeah. about ex being experimental, um, you know, it, there are other experimental non-Zoom options out there, but one thing I like about Gather is it's relatively kind on your browser. There's a project that uh, the Mozilla Foundation created which yeah. is like literally the Oasis. It's running yes. like an early, it's running a mid nineties 3D game in your browser, right. but it turns out web browsers are not 3D rendering engines. So the performance is God yeah. awful, even on a really powerful computer. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's another one called Altspace that we should, <laughs> we should try out eventually too. Very Oasis like uh, a little better on the browser, but uh 2D first, y'all, baby steps. <laughs> yes, and you know, we're part of why we record these meetups and everything is EFF Austin tries to be an accessible organization. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the mm -hmm. money for a right. super powerful computer, we want you to still be able to participate, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, um, you know, you'll get in there and, and move your little avatar around. I'm already in there, I'm, a, I'm over at the bar. So just come and see me over at the bar area up at the top of the screen. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's it. Best on Chrome browser, if possible. Um, and you know, as I said, you're welcome to drop a comment in the Meetup event or Facebook event if like 
or, or tweet at us if like you try to join and everything horrifically fails, I will hopefully see it and maybe be able to walk you through tech support. <laughs> But yeah, um, so cool. as I said, this is an experiment. Maybe it will be a beautiful disaster. We don't know yet, but you know, we, we, we're all about, uh, you know, the electronic frontier here. So this seemed totally in that spirit. So we're, uh, we're gonna try it out and see how it goes. <laughs> awesome. And I wanna thank everybody for the very fine, kind comments. Um, we really appreciate your support. You know, we realize uh, while there aren't as many places to be as normal uh, during COVID times, there's still many places you could be on a Tuesday night. Uh, and so we thank you for joining us. I mean, you all could have chosen to go to the amazing uh, Nerd Night talks over at Nerd Night Austin on Twitch, where my friend Mike Stefanik is talking about his amazing Eureka Room, which you all should check out if you're ever in Austin and COVID ever ends, uh, as far as amazing virtual experiences. But we really appreciate the support. It means a lot. And uh, we, uh, we try to fulfill the trust that uh, you all place in us. Um, and as I said, if you ever want to reach out to us about anything, um, you know, work and life keep me busy, but I will try to respond to you as promptly as I can. Um, Kevin, let's do this again <laughs> in a year, okay? And, uh, yeah. you know, I saw that my post got like 1,800 views on LinkedIn about this topic. You did a good job promoting and uh, got us on a lot of people's radars who have not heard of us before. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think people care about this stuff. Let's do it again in a year, okay? Uh, absolutely, Owen. Uh, well, we'll touch base then. Um, anyway, I hope we'll see a number of you in the uh, happy hour. If we don't, no worries. This is purely there for anybody who's interested. But uh, thank you all and uh, enjoy your evening. And hopefully yeah, drinks are on me at the happy hour. Yeah, the drinks virtual, are on virtual me. drinks are on Owen. Remember that. All right, see you all there. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Good to see you, Owen. Thanks for putting it up. All right. Good seeing you again, Mike. We're going to do our science club in the real.